My mom is a paramedic, been in the NHS for 30 plus years, a well-known member of the staff. And like her reputation, she is known for her fair share of ghost stories about the old morgue in northwest England, which has been torn down with the rest of the hospital and has a housing estate on it. Her most freaky one has to be when they dropped an expired patient at the morgue. This happened back in the 90s when the hospital was still used. They had been in the morgue handing over an expired patient. This next bit of info is important to the story. The ambulance bay was a concrete garage with one tiny dim light inside and was directly opposite the morgue slash mortuary. The ambulance needed a key to lock all the doors. Mum and her colleague walked out of the morgue, chatting away like you normally do when her colleague stopped dead and stared into the ambulance bay. There, in the far corner, behind the dim light was a dark figure standing. Now another bit of info is that this was at night. They brushed it off as just an object at the back of the bay after it didn't move and the light made it difficult to see. They made their way to the ambulance thinking nothing of it and got in, using the key to unlock it. Mum put the key in the ignition but didn't turn the engine on as they had to fill the rest of the paperwork out. While they were filing paperwork out, the ambulance doors suddenly locked. All of them. From the outside. They froze, looked at each other, then looked up in front of them. As they looked up, both their eyes locked onto the door of the morgue which they had watched swing open, and another figure walked silently out of and began to walk straight for the ambulance. In my mom's words, they bricked it, started to freak out as that thing got closer. They couldn't get out of the ambulance due to it being locked from the outside. Their only choice was to drive off. As they did, the figure vanished in thin air and the morgue door it was still wide open. Oh, but couldn't they just go back to their station? Well, that hospital was their ambulance station. They refused to go back until it was bright outside. Mum recalls them coming back in the morning and her colleagues describing her being sheet white. And they were the same after Mum told them the story. They all refused to park there after that, or even avoid going to that morgue if possible. Whoever lives on that site now, I feel so, so sorry for you. She has many more ghost stories. Some of them are even quite amusing. They genuinely are as it's mixed with my mom's dark sarcasm. I'll definitely share them if you guys are down for that. Generally ghost stuff doesn't bother her, but this particular incident really did. I volunteered after Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans and there was something there that still scares me to this day. Okay, here it goes. I have a medical background and a certification I rarely use, though I keep going back and paying to renew it. Anyhow, I volunteered almost immediately, thinking I would help those who have lived through Katrina. That was not the case. There were a few of us who were assigned once the water started to recede to find houses that had dead bodies in them. If you've ever had to do a body recovery when it's been lying around in the heat and water for days, sometimes weeks at a time, you know how it smells. It does sort of smell like any other dead carcass, but worse. I can't explain it, maybe somehow sweeter smelling. Anyway, the key to not vomiting when you smell them is Vicks in and around the bottom of your nose. It doesn't keep all the smell out, but enough until you can at least tolerate the smell without vomiting. We had to go to each house and go inside in wading boots and look for bodies. Many of them had washed out to sea, but some were still in the houses they had lived in prior to the hurricane. If we found a body, we spray painted a big X on the outside of the house. This other guy and I had been doing it for a while and we got assigned each other almost every day. We got along okay and he didn't vomit at the ones that had been gotten to. We came up to this one old shack. I say shack because it was pretty run down in what must have been a very bad neighbourhood. Right away I got chills down my spine. I knew there was something really wrong. Not like find a dead body kind of wrong, but chilling kind of wrong. New Orleans has certain areas that just give off these vibes, and my understanding is there's a lot of voodoo practiced in certain areas. Anyway, against everything my body was screaming at me, we went into the house. 
The first thing I could smell was a body. The second was something almost earthy and moldy. I looked at my partner, we'll call him Jay. He was white as a sheet. I could tell he was getting the same feeling I was getting. It was obvious from the weird bones hanging from the ceiling. I'd almost bet they were cats. Something odd had been going down in the house as well as strange beads and carvings in the bare wood in the walls. We went into what was a kitchen and there chained to a beam was an old lady or what was left of her. She had chained herself by her wrists to the beam. Her guts were falling out on the floor. The creepiest thing was her face still looked as though she was alive, staring at us with a wicked smile showing only partial teeth. My skin started crawling as the goosebumps spread over my body and my neck hair stood up. Suddenly I heard the most unearthly cackling I had ever heard in my life and my fight or flight kicked in. Jay and I noped out of there, we quickly painted the X and literally ran to the next house. Now I don't know if that old lady had practiced voodoo or whatever, but that scared the ever-living shit out of me. It still gives me nightmares. The people I feel sorry for are the ones that had to take that crazy lady out of there. Jay and I discussed it that night after we went back to the hotels just north of there. He had heard the cackling too, but we both just dismissed it as the wind. I went on a little hiking trip with my dad to Shasta, California, a small town in Northern California near the Oregon border. Shasta is home to a potentially active volcano named, of course, Mount Shasta. There are many trails on Mount Shasta, so my father and I were excited to do some hiking. We drove up the side of the mountain to the parking lot in which one of the trails begins. I believe it was called the Old Ski Bowl Trail. The landscape was a very barren incline filled with rocks, boulders, dirt, and very few trees. About an hour into the trail, we came across a very odd assembly of these large boulders. They were arranged in a circle. We thought it was strange, but we continued on. If you look up pictures of the trail, you'll see much smaller rocks arranged in patterns and circles. My father and I only encountered three people. At least, that's what they appeared to be at first. The first two were a father and son. We met them on a steep incline that went along the wall of a cliff that would then switch back as it reached the top of the cliff. We stopped and said hello, talked about the trail, and then went our separate ways. And here's where it gets weird. Dan and I kept walking up the incline for just about two minutes. I turned around and saw the father and son so far down the trail. It should have taken them at least 20 minutes to get down to where they were, but somehow... They were in only about two minutes. To this day, I have absolutely no idea how that could have happened. There was no one else on the trail at this point, and I could see the color of their clothes from that distance, so I knew it was them. I pointed it out to my dad. We thought it was weird, but we didn't dwell on it and just kept going. And here is where it gets so much weirder. As we reached the top of the cliff, there was another strange rock arrangement that was off to the side of the trail. This time, there were far more rocks than before and they were now arranged in rows, almost like gravestones. We continued on the trail and reached another sort of incline with a switchback to reach the top of another cliff. We reached a point where we would need climbing gear to continue so we decided to head back. When we turned around, I saw a man standing among the rocks, staring at us. He was wearing a button-up shirt, cargo shorts, and a wide brim straw hat. He was at a distance where I should have been able to make out his facial features, but it was almost as if he had none, like his face was just flesh and skin. I pointed them out to my dad, and then the man quickly ducked down behind a boulder and was peering out at us over the top of the boulder. It seemed almost playful, like a child trying to hide. For a few minutes, I was out of it, and I had no recollection of what was going on. According to my dad, I just started walking towards the man in the hat. My dad was calling to me. Joshua. Josh, what are you doing? Where are you going? And then I came to. I was standing right at the edge of a cliff. And it was a huge drop. Enough to kill me or at least seriously injure me. My dad grabbed me and pulled me back to the trail. He told me to stay put and my dad went down to the boulders to search for the man. But he wasn't there. 
There was nowhere for him to go except up or down the trail. It didn't make any sense. He just disappeared. I have no idea what was going on on that trail and I have no explanation for it. I've told this many times to family and friends and no one has any explanation. I've done research and found similar stories about encounters with a man with no facial features wearing a hat. I've also read that the Native American tribes from the area viewed Mount Shasta as a holy site. They believed it could act as a portal to other dimensions and that it is guarded by spirits who would potentially harm anyone who tried to go up the volcano. If anybody has any similar experiences or insight at all, I'd love to hear. Please share anything that you have to offer. My husband and I bought a townhouse back in September of 2017 and we've had super weird things happen since. Most of these experiences have happened on our second story. For background, where the stairs come up my office is immediately to the left. Then there is a long hall to the right with the hallway bathroom, the laundry room just past that, my son's room on the other side, and the master bedroom at the very end of the hall. The access to the attic is in the master bedroom closet. As our family goes, it's me, my husband, our son, and our two large dogs. When we first moved in, our son was only two or three years old and had just started making full sentences. He would be playing all day long without any issues, but whenever it started to get dark outside, he started getting nervous and wouldn't want to be in his room. He had come downstairs at one point saying, Mommy, do you hear it? Hear what, kiddo? The baby's crying, Mommy. My son is an only child, so you can imagine my confusion at this. I came upstairs with him and I asked him where he was hearing it from, thinking he may be hearing the neighbors through the walls. He took my hand and pulled me towards the master bedroom, stopping just short of the threshold. He pointed to the darkest corner of the room and said, Over there. The baby is crying over there. My body went numb at this, but I tried to brush it off and told him that there was no baby and he's just imagining it. This persisted for about a month before he finally stopped talking about the crying baby. During this time, I had been doing research on her house and there had been no deaths in the house that I could find, let alone any kids that lived in the house before us. A few weeks after my son stopped mentioning the baby, I started hearing scratching noises right above my bed in the attic. I told my husband and he thought we had a raccoon or some other animal in the attic. He went up a few days later and there was nothing. I'm normally a heavy sleeper, but at least twice a week I would wake up to a faint scratching noise right above me. I did my best to ignore it and just got back to sleep. This seemed to work as we hadn't had an issue for a while up until recently. I have always felt somewhat uneasy on the second floor, but I just attributed it to my past paranormal experiences growing up and just being a little paranoid. Now I'm thinking my senses were on point. A few months ago, my husband and I were talking about how our son had this weird affinity for the crying baby when he was younger, and I had mentioned that one day when I was taking a nap, I woke up abruptly to being sideways on the bed with one leg hanging off towards the closet, almost like I was being dragged towards it. However, I don't remember being pulled at all, and I do flop around a lot in my sleep, so I brush it off. After I told my husband about this, he frowned a bit and said he had a weird experience too recently. Apparently he woke up one morning at around 2.30, 3am and saw a figure standing by his side of the bed. He said it was all black and he couldn't really make out a face or any distinct features. He went to kick the figure thinking someone may have broken into the house and his foot went right through the figure. This freaked him out a little and he is a firm believer that if you don't acknowledge paranormal things, they can't do anything. So of course he rolls over and goes back to sleep and doesn't even think to mention it to me until I told him about my experience. The whole time we've been here, the dogs will randomly get spooked or stare at something that I don't see. Every once in a while, our wolf hybrid, who is typically scared of his own shadow, will get very upset and his hair will stand on end, and he will emit a low but vicious growl. 
Her other dog is a Malinu Black Lab mix, but she is getting old, 10 years old now, and doesn't really do much other than sleep on her bed and try to get all the pets and treats from us. And this brings us to the present. Yesterday there was a decent storm that came through our area. It was semi-dark out and thundered every once in a while. I am working from home during the virus pandemic and my mom had come to pick up my son at around 11.30am so I can work in peace without my son continuously bothering me. A few hours later, I'm listening to a podcast while working and I hear a faint mumble that sounded almost like, Mommy? The chilling thing is, is that it sounded exactly like my son. I turned around to tell him that he needed to go back to his room and not to bother me while I was working, but as I was turning around I remembered that he wasn't even home. I was here by myself with the dogs. There was no one behind me and no one down the hall. At this point, I tried to brush it off thinking my mind is playing tricks on me when my wolf hybrid starts losing it. All his hair goes up, he gets between me and the door and starts doing this low growl. This freaked me out a little bit, but I told him to stop, which he listened and laid back down, but without taking his eyes off the hallway. About an hour later, I was in the zone with work and was talking with a coworker on our team chat. They sent me something funny enough to make me audibly laugh. I then heard a tiny giggle that sounded exactly like my son coming from his room down the hallway, who still isn't home at this point. I nearly fall out of my chair at this point with how scared I was. I got up and checked all the rooms upstairs, but I was home alone like I thought. I had to get back to work as we were starting to get busy, but I was on edge and straining to hear if anything else was happening behind me. About ten minutes later I hear the crash of something relatively small but still loud downstairs. My dog starts down the steps while I follow behind them. My PlayStation controller, which was originally on the charging stand behind the TV, was in the middle of the living room floor. This made my blood run cold as we had not had anything physically moved yet and I had a full-blown panic attack. I called my husband who was already on his way home and said he would be there soon. When he got home, everything seemed to stop. This all happened from about 2 to 4.30 p.m. in the middle of a little thunderstorm. I have looked into it and from what I gather... When something can mimic voices like that, it's typically evil or demonic. Should I be worried? What should I do in this situation? I don't want to scare my son and we can't move. But I am extremely paranoid and scared to be home alone now. Any help is appreciated at this point. I'm a 21 year old male but already so many things have happened to me. I'm always scared when I'm alone somewhere or at night because after all what happened I don't know what could come next. I will tell you guys one to two early stories and if you'll be interested I'll tell everything. Some may sound very unbelievable but trust me everything is true. 1999. The first encounter, my mother told me this one and I was just a newborn. My mother was making dinner in the kitchen and I was sleeping in my room upstairs. She had the baby phone on and she can hear me when I wake up. She heard crying through the baby phone so she went upstairs to check on me. I was still sleeping and she got very confused. She went back to the kitchen and heard the crying again. Checked on me again but I was still sleeping. She turned off the baby monitor because she thought maybe it's broken. She went to the kitchen and nothing happened for like an hour. Then she heard the crying again through the phone and she started to freak out. She ran upstairs and I was still sleeping and the baby monitor was still turned off. She took me downstairs because she was really scared at this point. She called my father and told him the story and told him to come home. As she was waiting for him with me in her arms, she heard the crying again through the baby monitor but this time it was different. It started out as a baby cry but slowly went to a deep louder voice and by the end it was just a loud deep shouting. My mom almost passed out but she stayed strong to protect me. She ran out of the house and waited for my father who arrived a few minutes later. After this nothing happened for like three years but this was just the beginning. 2003, I was four years old. I remember some parts of this but mostly my mom told me what happened 
I was playing with my mom in the living room at night because my father always came home late from work, but we always waited for him. We had a great time as always, but then it happened again. I saw a tall woman in a black dress. I wasn't scared at all, actually. I was very calm, and I asked my mother, Who's the tall lady, Mommy? What lady are you talking about, son? The one standing in the corner. She started to freak out a little bit, but didn't take it too seriously as I was only four and very creative. There's no one else here, I promise you. But she's standing right behind you, Mom. Then she really started to freak out, but still kept it together so I wouldn't see that she was scared. She stepped back to show me that no one was there. See? There's no one here, just the two of us. But I can see her, Mom. She's right behind you. And now she's looking very angry at you. My mom didn't know what to say at this point. My father arrived home before she could say anything. She said right before my father opened the door, she felt a very cold breath on her neck. I have recently posted a story on this thread regarding a dead boy who contacted me in my dream, asking for help. I'm posting this because it affected me even more and I would appreciate any suggestions or advice. My uncle died 10 years ago. Him and my auntie were on holiday in Egypt, cruising on a ship that day, going snorkeling and he had all of a sudden got up and left my auntie without a word while they were preparing to snorkel, went to the edge and jumped in. They were incredibly close and my auntie thought it was very odd of him to do that but 10 minutes later they found out that he was dead. The autopsy revealed that he had had a heart attack but also drowned. It's been 10 years and my aunt is still not fully over it. She was on antidepressants for many years. She cried so much that her skin under her eyes were raw. Three years ago I had this dream. I was standing in this weird place. There was a corridor in front of me. Sort of if one of the walls of the corridor was missing so I could see what was happening. There was a swaying double door on one end and hundreds of people passing through the corridor and through the door. When the door swayed open there was an incredible light in there. I knew that those people were souls who had passed away. Now, every time they had gone through the door, they were thrown back to the beginning of the corridor, over and over again. It felt like an old video cassette being stuck repeating the same snip. Walking among these souls was my uncle, being constantly thrown back, walking again and again. This carried on maybe 30 times while he spotted me standing by. I could see that he was in a complete and utter shock seeing me there and had the saddest look on his face I'd ever seen. It had pierced my heart. After a while he strayed away and came up to me, grabbed my shoulders by both hands tears running down his face saying, you have to help me, I don't belong here, I'm not supposed to be here. I asked what is this place, he then replied, please tell auntie that I love her so much that I miss her, please. I then pointed at the door and asked what's behind the door. At this point he became sort of angry, stepped away a bit, pointed a finger at me and shouted, you are not supposed to know that. At that point, this entity flew in between me and him and with the biggest force threw my whole body away. I could not see its actual form but it looked like a grey shadow. In my mind I knew it was a demon or somewhat of a demonic form and the anger that was radiating from it was the worst I'd ever experienced. It was so angry and shouted at me. How did you get in here? How were you allowed to witness this? This is not for you to see. Who let you in here? The voice of it was very deep and not human. He then told me, telepathically, that I have to pay for witnessing what I had witnessed, and he threw me into this marsh. I knew that I had a choice. I was given a choice. Either I drown and stay where I was, among the other souls, or fight. I could feel the mud raising to my chest, then to my neck and mouth. I had never in my entire life fought this much for my life. It took absolutely everything in me to try to get out of there and when I pulled everything I had in me I saw a little round window that appeared on this wall. 
I pulled myself toward the window and squeezed through, and that very moment I woke up. I got an instant migraine, the biggest migraine I had ever had in my life. The pain was excruciating and running all the way up and down the back of my head. It felt like someone had beat me up with a baseball bat. I only then found out that this place is called Purgatory in mythology, and apparently guarded by demons. I lit a candle for my uncle, sent him a light, but I still have this on my mind as I feel he is stuck there for some reason. I have also never passed the message to my auntie. I don't have the heart to do it, considering how much she had been through. To reopen the wound in her, I just can't. I would really appreciate any suggestions and opinions. Update. I have now contacted my aunt, and this is what I said. I feel compelled to pass this message on to you as I've been holding this for quite some time now because I didn't want to poke into your wound. I had a dream about Uncle Yosef, and I know it wasn't just a regular dream, and he told me to tell you that he loves you very much and wants you to be happy. I do get contacted by the ones that pass from time to time as they sense that I am some sort of a channel, and I know deeply that if I am being told a passive message that I am compelled to do so no matter what. I energetically feel that he needs you to let him go now, not to forget him, but don't dwell on this burden anymore. He needs that. So about two years ago, my Nana brought home a Ouija board that she had found at the yard sale. I've always been a true believer in the paranormal and it's always been one of my peak interests. I have heard and read enough stories and watched enough shows to know not to mess with the Ouija board and quite frankly they kind of freaked me out so I wanted nothing to do with it. My Nana on the other hand doesn't believe in the paranormal whatsoever and thought it was just a fun game for myself, my brother and the oldest of my two cousins. I left it on the dining room table for days before she made me put it away. I ended up sliding it under my bed in hopes of just forgetting about it. My brother, 11, and my cousin, 12, bugged me about it constantly because they wanted to play with it and I wouldn't let them. I tried to explain to them that it wasn't just a game and that it shouldn't be messed with, but they were preteen boys who couldn't help but do things that they shouldn't. One day after I got home from work, the boys were there and I had this sneaking suspicion they played with it. I looked under my bed and it was there, but I had this odd feeling about it. That's when I went downstairs and interrogated them about it. At first, they denied it, but I saw right through them and they finally admitted that they had played with it. I asked them if they had said goodbye when they were done and they said that they did. My cousins like to over-exaggerate stories big time and make things up to be overly dramatic, so when he told me about a couple of things that supposedly happened, I didn't believe him at all. Also, they were boys who liked to mess with each other, so I assumed that was what was happening. A couple of nights later, I got in bed, and as I lay there, trying to fall asleep, I get this feeling like I'm being watched. I looked over at my closet, which has two sliding doors, and I notice one of the doors is slightly open, leaving a small space between the doors. It creeped me out for some reason, so I turn and face the other way, trying to ignore everything and fall asleep. I finally fell asleep, and then, the next thing I know, I'm woken up by what felt like someone, or something, hitting me in the back of the head. I was laying on my back so the back of my head was fully on my pillow which made it even weirder and it wasn't a light hit either. It freaked me out so much that I was shaking. I looked around my room and I don't see anything but then all of a sudden I hear my floor creaking like someone is walking around my bed. I'm so freaked out at this point it wasn't funny. After laying there for a good little while I finally got the courage to get up and grab my phone and book it to my living room. I sat down and tried to calm down. I could still feel a tingling, pulsating sensation in the back of my head. I turned on my phone and realized it's 3 in the morning. I called my boyfriend, now husband, with tears streaming down my face from being so freaked out. He didn't pick up and I swear I called him another 15 to 20 times before I finally gave up. I sat in the chair until my nana got up around 6. I didn't tell her what happened because... I knew she wouldn't believe me and would say I was acting stupid. After she got up, I had breakfast and then called my boyfriend again and he finally picked up. He told me he had his phone on silent mode, so he didn't know that I had been calling. 
and I gave him so much guff for this, let me tell you. I told him what happened, and he felt terrible and felt like an idiot for having his phone on silent, and he told me he would have come over in a heartbeat to comfort me and was very apologetic. Later that day, he came over and took the Ouija board to a junkyard to get rid of it. My husband is the only one in the family that knows what happened, and I didn't experience anything again after I got rid of the Ouija board. Moral of the story, Ouija boards should not be messed with. My friend Emily called me one night during our sophomore year of high school. She was audibly shaken and told me that a name had popped up on her wall. She knew I was into these types of things, so I told her to send me a picture. I wish I still had the picture today because you really had to see this name actually bubbling up under the paint on the wall, the same way that you get air bubbles while applying stickers. The name Mike was clearly on her bedroom wall. She assured me that she had never seen it before and that she had slept in the same room her entire life, so I could only assume that she was telling the truth. I had seen plenty of ghost hunting TV shows, so my first thought was to do an EVP session, basically recording yourself talking to the spirit and hope that you catch it talking back. So I told her to do one and to call me after she listened to it. She called maybe five minutes later and told me that she didn't hear anything particularly concerning, I asked her if she specifically mentioned the name Mike, and when she said she didn't, I told her to do another recording and mention the name specifically. We hung up the phone, and she called back in under a minute. She said that as soon as she asked about the name, there was an owl that started to hoo outside of a window, which didn't seem too odd to me at the time. I told her that I would be over after school the next day, and we would see what we could do. We got to her house at like 3.15ish, Her dad was still at work, so it was just us and the dog, who was really aggressive, so we put him in the garage. The first thing I did was grab one of her dad's beers, and she got an apple to eat. We sat for a bit in her kitchen and talked about a couple of things, I'm sure before beginning our ghost hunt. Now, when I tell the story in person, I make sure to explain the layout of her house, so that it's easier to imagine what I was seeing. For the sake of this post, I'll just tell the story. So we start the recorder and start to walk her upstairs. I ask the typical questions like, is there anybody here with us and is there something you want to say to us? But as soon as I asked about the name Mike, an owl started to hoo outside of her window, which startled the both of us. I turned to walk down the stairs and while my back was to her, I heard a loud thud and turned around to see Emily on the floor at the top of the stairs. There were only like six steps. I know this is cliche, but the look on her face was as if though she had seen a ghost. She stood up and practically jumped down the stairs, slipped her shoes on and ran out the door and down the street. I was already spooked by the owl, so of course I started running after her and away from the house. I finally caught her and she was crying frantically while fighting to catch her breath. I asked her if she was okay and how she fell and her response was, I didn't fall. I was pushed. You will get a chance to hear other stories from me in the near future about why I felt the way that I did upon hearing this from my friend, but I was upset. I stopped being scared. I felt as if though I could control whatever was going on in her house and that hurt my friend, and I was ready for a fight. I took her back inside and sat her at the kitchen table. I grabbed my tape recorder and the beer bottle I had drank and went upstairs to provoke the spirit. I threw the bottle on the ground and said, Since you want to be tough, pick the bottle up and hit me. Nothing happened and I turned to go down the stairs. I turned the tape recorder off and sat at the kitchen table across from Emily. Her back was to the stairs. After I pressed play on the recorder, she kept telling me to stop it and to turn it off. I brushed it off at first, but as she got more persistent about it in my gut, it started to tell me something isn't right. So I stopped the tape recorder and asked her why she didn't want me listening to it and she couldn't give me a straight answer. I pressed record on the tape recorder and continued asking a couple of more times before she sank from her chair and sat, kneeling on the floor next to the table. I asked, Emily, why are you sitting on the floor? Get up and sit in the chair. She replied, I don't want to sit up high. 
I had no idea what she was talking about, but every time I told her to sit in the chair, that was her reply. I don't want to sit up high. Now remember, I was recording this, so I stopped the tape recorder and started to rewind it to listen to what I had just recorded. When I pressed play, my friend Emily began to crawl around the table very slowly. As I listened to what I had recorded, I heard myself tell Emily to sit in the chair. But then there was a man's voice that would say, I don't want to sit up too high. Literally right before Emily said it. Not like an echo. The entire phrase was said prior to Emily speaking on the recording. So I'm hearing this as she's basically crawling towards me and we lock eyes for a second. Then she starts like jumping while on her knees, banging them on the floor and screaming. I was absolutely terrified. But I was also 6 foot and 200 some odd pounds and she's maybe 5 foot 6 or 7 and probably 130. So I just told her she'd better calm down before I beat her. I laugh looking back on that because I really didn't mean it. She gave me this super creepy evil glare and giggled in the most evil spiritish sort of way. She got up from the floor and walked out of the kitchen and up the stairs while I'm facing from my seat. On her way up she grabs the beer bottle I threw on the ground earlier and the apple she had when she was pushed before running out of the house. She then walks back into her room at which point I no longer can see her and I'm left sitting at the table trying to make sense of what I just experienced. As I'm sitting there dumbfounded, she comes down the stairs with the beer bottle but no apple and she's holding the bottle upside down by the neck with the same creepy evil glare as if she wanted to hit me with it. Remember, early when she first came back in the house, I threw it on the floor and told the spirit to hit me with it. I once again told Emily, Emily, I love you. But if you try to hit me with that bottle, I'm going to knock you out. She did the evil giggle again, and she told me that she wasn't going to hit me, then walk past me at the table and put the bottle on the sink. She then sat at the table in the chair next to me and just started rolling up the newspaper sitting on the table. Emily has this obsidian rock that she put on a string and wore as a necklace. She had a particular bond with the rock and always had it on her. I noticed she wasn't wearing it and asked her where it was. She just sat there with her head down rolling the newspaper and said, What rock? At this point I was positive that I was no longer talking to Emily and I grabbed her hand. As soon as I did, she looked up at me and her entire presence changed. Just by the look in her face I could tell that she was back and she just sat there looking at me as if we were in a mid-conversation waiting for me to speak. I said something along the lines of, Dude, what was that? She of course had no idea what I was talking about. Turned out she didn't remember anything after coming back inside after running down the street and sitting at the table. After showing her the recording of the man's voice and her talking with no recollection of doing so, we agreed to let the dog in and keep every light on in the house and sit in our room together until her dad got home. It was a terrifying experience. Emily never experienced anything else after that, but I had one other run-in with what I believed to be the same Mike entity. It happened three years later. The year after I graduated high school, I was telling the story to my girlfriend at the time and we were just hanging out. We both had two days off from work and it was the middle of summer, so we sat out on the balcony with the radio right outside the door. A few hours later, I had to leave for a little bit and received a picture message about an hour after I left. It was a picture of the concrete outside the back door where we placed the radio. The names Mike, M, and 91 were etched into the concrete, as if some kids did it when it was first poured. Of course, we would have seen it prior to this if we had been there seeing that we already were in the apartment for a few months at that point, and that was the exact place we put the radio when we were hanging out. That's how she noticed it because she was putting the radio away. And that's where the story ends. I keep in contact with Emily to this day. She's always uncomfortable talking about it, but has no problem confirming the story, at least from her perspective. Kind of a side note, Emily's middle name is Rose. There's a movie called The Exorcism of Emily Rose, so that's kind of weird. But she's a mother and a wife, and seems to be leading a seemingly happy life now. I'm 
a pediatric nurse and was on a night shift recently. I was in charge, so the girls before me handed over that they logged a clinical engineering job for call bell number 7. This was because the call bell kept ringing non-stop, starting at 2200 hours. There were no patients in the room, as it's an empty double door room. The call bells were disconnected from the wall, and it still continued to ring. I said I would hand over in the morning to the charge nurse so she could follow up with engineering. I thought nothing of it, as it was ringing when I started my shift and just thought how annoying it was going to be all night, as it dings really loudly every two minutes. At midnight before we start doing rounds, I went to inspect the room and note all the call bells are disconnected from the wall, and nothing looks amiss besides one pillow missing from the bed next to the door. I remind myself to bring a pillow next time. I walk past to ensure the room is set up for a potential new patient in the morning. My coworker, Molly, is floating between pods. The ward is divided into two pods. Molly is a serious and hard-working older nurse who is a devout Christian. She is going into room 8 to do an IV antibiotic, and I walk down with her as I am the nurse looking after pod 1, where room 7 is located. I'm about to allocate a room to a new kid coming in. I walk past room 7 as it's on my way, and I think I should grab a pillow for the bed by the door, and I look into it as I walk past before getting a pillow, and oh my lord, the bed is sitting up, and it looks messy as if someone was sitting on it. I thought someone from a different room could have been messing around with the bed, so I wasn't shocked or worried. Molly finished her antibiotic and was gelling her hands outside the room next door when I asked her to come into room 7 and have a look. She asked if I was preparing the room for a new admission, and I said no. I asked her if she sat the bed up, and she said she hasn't been into the room as there aren't any patients, and she left the call bell problem to me as I was in charge. I say it looks like someone is sitting here waiting for their call bell to be answered. Molly pats the bed and says, Hello. And looks at me and I jokingly say, Hello mate, can you please stop ringing the bell? You're keeping the younger kids awake with all the noise. And we walk out shaking our heads at the weirdness of the situation. We look up as the call bell dings, and then the signal goes off for the first time since we started our shift. It never went on again that night. I had to explain to my manager why I logged an engineering job and for her to cancel it. There are so many potential explanations, but we have many odd things happen in pod 1 during the night, including people seeing and hearing the boy with the guitar, seeing a little girl come into their room and children sleepwalking and standing in the middle of the hallway, staring at the room. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Huge thank you to Slap Tam for lending his voice in today's video. He makes all kinds of amazing paranormal and out of this world content. Please head over to Slap Tam's channel now and maybe even subscribe to him. That would be sick. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community and maybe even hear your story featured in the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data. Located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, always. Go blanky mode.